This year's final episode of BPS TV is here. It's been a great week packed with learning, networking, and a passion for everything biophysics. All good things come to an end, as they say, and while BPS TV is no exception, we're here to deliver one last look into all of this meeting's highlights. I'm Lamore Abrams, back again for the last time this year as your host of BPS TV. The conference is about to wind down here, but we're still kicking with another great episode. Today we'll speak with Ardem Patapudian about his Nobel Prize winning work in pain, touch, sound and blood flow. Then we'll talk to Renee Ryan about this meeting's harassment and science panel. Lauren Porter will tell us about her research in a super hot topic, fold switching proteins. And meeting Chair Elizabeth Vila will give us a glimpse into what's down the road at the BPS 2024 meeting. Finally, we'll round out our list of cutting edge researchers with visits to Wisconsin, Berlin, Mississippi, and Milan. But first, our meeting chairs will share which sessions they're most looking forward to today. The Symposium Ion Channels on Drugs will cover some of the latest discoveries that are driving our understanding of the mechanisms of drug action on ion channels. These will ultimately lead to development of new therapeutics for key signaling complexes. Biophysics of viral entry has received quite a bit of attention in the past few years for obvious reasons. In the Symposium Viral Recognition, Entry and Egress, a diverse group of experts will present the latest developments in the field. Transport of many solute and metabolites in organelles is coupled to pH gradients. Dysfunction of these transporters lead to pathological conditions. In the Symposium on Proton-Coupled Transport of Organelles, the speakers will highlight the various cutting-edge approaches to understand the mechanism of transport and develop new therapies to treat disease conditions. And we're here now with our Dan Petipudian Nobel Prize winner for his work, Molecules That Sense Touch. Thank you so much for sitting down. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you. And uh, I guess we'll dive right into your research that um, focuses on the sensors that determine how we experience touch and pain, sound, and blood flow. Tell us what it was like earning the Nobel in physiology for this work. Um, it's a, it's a re remarkable uh, reinforcement in a way. You know, we scientists do science for the love of science. We love the process of discovery. We love coming into lab every day and interacting with the trainees who do the work. Um, but getting this kind of recognition is uh, something else in a way. And um, I feel very fortunate to be recognized and, and but always like to emphasize that it's a individuals get recognized for this, but it's really the accomplishment of a whole field of science, both within my lab and outside collaborators in the field. But it was a really, really special moment to hear it. Were you expecting it in any way? Not really. I think some people tell you that your work is at that caliber and, yeah. and you might hear it, but I think you kind of put that away because if you start expecting it, it's kind of a uh, not a good thing for, <laughs> for your psyche. Um, your, this meeting's BPS lecture, what information is covered in your talk? So because this is a um, kind of an overview talk with a broad audience, I thought I would first do a um, kind of review of the field and, and our findings summarize it in the last 20 years. But I know biophysicists love uh, new data and so I've also the last 15 minutes or so I'm going to include some some new unpublished data that I'm very excited about. Wow well speaking of what is um, next for your lab and where do you hope to see your research go? So you know uh, our whole lab is focused on this idea of mechanosensation so the idea is that most cells communicate by chemicals hormones neurotransmitters these are all chemicals but we also sense mechanical forces such as touch and pain and blood pressure. Um, so those are the known processes that depend on mechanosensation. But these molecules that we found that are responsible for initiating the sensations are also expressed in all kinds of different cell types that we didn't think mechanosensation is important. So the future actually is going to be expanding from these known fields to unknown areas of biology and diseases that depend on this process. So still a lot more to learn. When it There's comes still to a lot more to learn, I think. And um, I love the fact that we're at this interface of both incorporating human genetics data as well as our own 
work in animal models and uh, it, it's a very powerful combination and so I think lots of interesting new findings should come forward in the next few years. Incredible, we can't wait to see what you have in store. Ardem Padapudian, thank you so much. The University of Wisconsin in Madison's Cryo-EM Research Center provides services, training, and support for researchers using Cryo-EM at their own institution and beyond. Let's take a closer look. The Cryo-EM Research Center at UW-Madison is a state-of-the-art Cryo-EM Research Center that supports users from industry, academia, and government labs to do all forms of Cryo-EM that they're interested in. It's a very important facility for us because it gives us a national presence in an emerging area of, of science that cuts across all the boundaries. The things that excite me most are the people and the equipment because bringing those two pieces together really allows us to connect as a community. In my perspective, the future is, is unlimited. There are no boundaries for us. It's really thinking about how we develop these tools to then push the boundaries to answer a whole range of, of biological questions. Let's head to Berlin's Collaborative Research Center 1078. The center's primary research goal is to identify and understand the control and coordination of complex protein function by protonation dynamics. In this collaborative research center, the major research direction is on the relevance of protonation dynamics for protein function and mostly refer to membrane proteins. We want to understand how proton transfer controls uh, the function of these molecular machines. So we have methodologies like time-resolved vibrational spectroscopy to trace proton transfer reactions, but we need to modify the proteins. For that, we need to collaborate with molecular biologists who can exchange particular amino acids that act as proton donors and acceptors, and we also apply molecular dynamic simulations on the level of nucleic and electronic interactions. Our long-term perspective is looking at things like electric fields in, in, in proteins and we apply such principles to biological to living systems. Harassment is a really difficult topic to discuss, but it's important that we discuss it in our societies, like the Biophysical Society, because it is an issue um, that is quite widespread. It really impacts um, our, our students, our staff, it impacts scientific progress. I think our institutions need to set the standards of what they will accept and won't accept and really be clear about that and hold people to account. The focus of the symposium was also really about how can um, external levers drive institutional change, because unfortunately we've seen that institutions left to their own devices don't necessarily always do the right thing. Some of the external levers that we discussed is funding bodies such as the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation really being very clear on what they expect organisations to do, on how they want organisations to report um, when people have been found guilty. Some of the other programs we talked about um, are based on a program from the UK called Athena Swan and these are um, accreditation programs that really drive organisational cultural change. So these kind of External levers, I think, are really important to, to force institutions to do the right thing and to be on this journey. And then there'll be, there's also the competition between institutions themselves once people start moving. Actually, when I started studying fold switching proteins, people thought I was nuts because they didn't think fold switching mattered or like had any biological meaning. But when I started seeing more examples of it, like both engineered and in nature, I thought that there was probably something bigger going on. 
And so I wanted to be able to investigate and understand how these proteins work because I thought if we do understand better how these work, maybe we'll understand more about proteins in general. My lab actually integrates both computation and experiment. And so we come up with computational methods to be able to predict um, fold switching. We use a lot of bioinformatics because it's the most powerful method available to be able to do that on the computational end. But then once we've made our predictions, we take them to the lab. And so what we're doing now, because we want to be able to discover new fold switching proteins, is um, we're coming up with experimental methods to be able to screen for fold switching so we can really understand how biologically for pervasive it is. So it turns out that fold switching proteins are relevant to a number of diseases, cancer, Alzheimer's, tuberculosis, even COVID-19. And so it seems that this fold switching mechanism is an important regulation mechanism um, that exists in biology. And we think it may be possible to make small molecules that would target um, fold switching proteins and lock them in one conformation, which may deactivate them. So you could imagine like, a fold switching protein that causes disease, if you could prevent it from functioning, the disease might not be able to progress. Now, the University of Southern Mississippi Center for Molecular and Cellular Biosciences is focused on expanding research frontiers in biosciences. Through the pursuit of advanced research and infrastructure development, they're enriching graduate student education and embracing creativity and rigor. The Center for Molecular and Cellular Biosciences came into being right after the pandemic in 2020, uh, 2021. The idea behind that here at Southern Miss is that we want to bring together experts from our faculty, uh, from across various disciplines, from across different colleges even, into one center to work together in molecular and cellular biosciences. The main goal for us as a center is a couple of goals. One is to actually put the university and the center in the map of global life sciences research. Second, we want to achieve uh, greatness in our graduate education, where we want to be inclusive in bringing in people of color, women, underrepresented groups, and give them opportunities to showcase their talent and build and develop into researchers of the next generation. The thing that I would recommend to prospective CMCB graduate students is to just take the plunge, apply, come here, and you'll experience all the greatness that the CMCB Center has to offer. The very last stop on our tour of cutting-edge research groups is ISBE. It's an organized, multidisciplinary, and inclusive scientific community. Their work in systems biology is devoted to understanding biological complexity for biosociety development. Systems biology for me is the greatest innovation in life science. So far, life science has been studied in a reductionistic approach, so to understand the quantity and the structure of molecules. ISBE is an organized multidisciplinary scientific community devoted to understanding of biological complexity for biosociety development. I believe that the ISBE community will grow in Italy in terms of the network, in terms of the labs, in terms of the peoples, and I hope that this new vision of the biology, taking account of the complex systems, is a new vision that it could resolve some heavy medical problems. Having this year's meeting come to a close is super exciting. Uh, the Biophysical Society meeting is the last meeting I attended in 2020 before the pandemic and it just really feels like coming home and seeing everyone again and see junior people present amazing science. It's just, and having it at home again, it's just been fantastic. 
Attendees next year should look forward to a very dynamic program that Ibrahim and I work really hard in putting together. There will be a lot of junior speakers, there will be an effort to go into new technologies and new areas that biophysics can be applied to. BPS members should be involved in planning the annual meeting because this is their meeting, this is their society and their membership, and there's plenty of opportunities to say what it is that you want to hear because we want everyone to come to the meeting and feel at home and listen to the science that they're interested in. We're really looking forward to seeing you in Philadelphia. Thanks to you, Elizabeth, for that great insight into next year's meeting. And now let's head to the exhibit hall one last time to hear from NanoSurf about their atomic force microscope. I have here the Drive AFM. Uh, we released this a couple years ago. The Drive AFM is the only AFM that can go on an inverter microscope that has photothermal excitation. This lets you use the Drive AFM with uh, other optical techniques like confocal microscopy, fluorescence, or super resolution techniques. We come to BPS every year because we want to meet with the pioneers in the AFM industry and those that are working with uh, biological materials and show them what we can do and what, how we can help them in their applications. Last year at BPS we launched Wave Mode. I would ask everyone to just check back with us because we have really exciting advances coming out with nanomechanical analysis. Well, that is it for this cycle of BPS TV, but you can still find us right here and online, of course, to revisit all of this year's meeting highlights. You can keep watching BPS TV around the convention center, on the BPS website, in your hotel room, and on YouTube and Twitter. We'll catch you next year when the Biophysical Society makes its way to Philadelphia. I'm Lamore Abrams, signing off.